Electrostatic boundary conditions. In this video, I'll introduce briefly what boundary conditions are and maybe more importantly, why we need them. We'll discuss the boundary conditions for a dielectric dielectric interface and then generalize that a bit to a dielectric conductor interface. Introduction to boundary conditions. So what are boundary conditions? Well, the problem arises when we solve problems using differential equations. We like to use differential equations more than integral equations, I think because the math is easier, maybe it's more intuitive, easier to understand, but we definitely use differential equations most of the time. However, at a discontinuity, like at the interface between two materials, if that's a step discontinuity, and we calculate some kind of derivative across that, well, the slope, the second order derivative and all the others, they go to infinity, they explode. That means we can't take a derivative across an interface. So what do we do? Well, we have to separate our problem into separate homogeneous regions. We'll solve the differential equation separately inside of each homogeneous region. And then finally, we'll have to apply boundary conditions, which usually has some sort of the function needs to be continuous across the interface type of story. So we can connect the functions that we've solved on either side and then solve the overall higher level problem. So anytime we need differential equations, we also need boundary conditions. How do we derive the boundary conditions? Well, we needed them because we're using differential equations. So integral equations don't actually need boundary conditions unless they contain derivatives in them. So if our integral equations don't require boundary conditions, then the information provided to us from the boundary conditions must be hidden inside these integral equations. So in fact, to derive our electromagnetic boundary conditions, we will go to Maxwell's equations in integral form to derive the boundary conditions. From Ampere's circuit law, we will derive the boundary conditions for the tangential components of the electric fields, both E and D. And then from Gauss's law, we will derive the boundary conditions for the normal components of the electric fields. So the normal and tangential components will have separate boundary conditions. When we analyze problems, we'll take our field, we'll decompose it into a tangential normal component, We'll apply the boundary conditions separately to get the field in the other medium and then combine them to get the overall field. Boundary conditions for dielectric dielectric interface. Here's the analysis setup. So we have medium one described by permittivity epsilon one. And we have medium two described by permittivity epsilon two. So we'll, we'll define some kind of electric field in both mediums, and we want to figure out how those are related. And it turns out we don't have an infinite choice. We cannot arbitrarily choose E1 and E2. They have to be related through the boundary conditions. So to do this, we will separate each of those fields into their normal and tangential components, and we'll look at them separately. Let's derive the boundary conditions for the tangential component of the electric fields. As I mentioned previously, this will come from Ampere's circuit law, which is a closed contour line integration that if we perform, we set equal to zero. So we choose a box that spans the interface between our two different materials and we'll integrate in this clockwise direction. To do this, we're going to separate our closed contour line integration into six separate line integrals. So starting at point A, the first integral over here is going to integrate from point A to point B. The second integral will integrate from B to zero, right at the interface. Then the third integral will go from zero to point C. The fourth integral will integrate from C to D. Then the fifth integral from D to zero right up at the interface. And then to finish, our sixth integral goes from zero to A. 
So notice on these perpendicular sides, we've broken those up into actually on each side, two separate line integrals. So this is actually quite easy to do. Let's just take the first integral from A to B. Well, we need the tangential component. That's what comes out of the dot product. DL is in the direction connecting A to B. So we can just write that generally as E1 because we're in medium one and T the tangential component. And then the length from A to B is delta W. Now, when we integrate from B to zero, this is the normal component of the electric field in medium one. And we're only integrating along half of this side. So if this entire side is delta H, then half of the side is delta H over two. Then we integrate on the second half of that line, but now we're in medium two. So it's the normal component of E sub two. And the distance is delta H over two. Then we'll integrate from C to D. Now we're going in the opposite direction of our positive axis. So we need the negative sign. And I should have mentioned it up here. Since we're going downward on this line integral on the right, we also have a negative sign. And there's a negative sign here because we're going right to left. We're in medium two. So it's the tangential component of E2. And we integrate over length delta W. Now we're going in the positive direction again. So we're going from D to zero. That's a distance of delta H over two. And this is the normal component of E sub two. And then finally, we're back in medium one going from zero to A. So it's the normal component of E1 again, and the distance is delta H over two. So we really just did this by observation. If we look at these terms, what we'll see is we see the same terms, but with opposite signs. And so we can cancel all of them. And we're left with this equation. We have zero equals E1 tangential times delta W minus E2 tangential times delta W. Well, we can divide both sides by W. We can then bring the E1 and E2 to opposite sides of the equation, and we end up with our final boundary condition. And the general conclusion is that the tangential component of the electric field intensity is continuous across an interface. They must be equal to each other. What about the tangential components of the electric flux? Well, we start with this boundary condition for the electric field intensity, and we apply the constitutive relation. So E1 tangential is simply D1 tangential divided by the permittivity in that medium. And likewise, E2 tangential is D2 tangential divided by the permittivity in the second medium. So now we have a boundary condition for the tangential components of the electric flux. So the conclusion here is that the tangential component of the electric flux is not continuous across the interface. However, this ratio of the tangential component of the electric flux divided by permittivity is continuous across the interface. We're going to repeat a similar process, but using a different starting equation. And so we'll derive the boundary conditions for the normal components of our electric fields. We're adding one more thing. We're letting the interface have some kind of surface charge density. We set up a little pillbox because we need to integrate. We have this closed contour surface integration from Gauss's law. And so we'll choose this little pillbox shaped thing. And so the, the top and the bottom will have area delta S and it will have height delta H. So we separate this into three separate surface integrals. We have essentially the, the top of the cylinder, we'll have the bottom of the cylinder, and then we have the sides. So top, bottom, and sides. Now in the limit, as the height of this cylinder, this little pillbox goes to zero, the surface area on the sides also goes to zero. So this third surface integration completely disappears and we really only have to be concerned with the top and the bottom, which we can write by observation. 
Now this top surface, when it's right up against the surface is completely tangential to the surface. Since we're integrating flux, we're only interested in the normal component of the electric flux. And we're also in medium one. So our flux is in the positive direction. So we do not need a negative sign outside. That's a positive sign. It's the normal component of D1 times the surface area. Now for the bottom, our flux is in the negative direction. So we have a negative sign here, but it's the D in the second medium, D sub two normal component times the surface area. Now the total charge on either one of these surfaces is simply the surface charge density times this surface area of the top and the bottom. So that's our charge Q. It's our surface charge density times the area. And then we also have this expression that we derive by integrating the flux. So we have all of this together. And of course, we can see that the next step is going to be divide by delta S and we will have arrived at our boundary condition. So here is the final boundary condition for the normal component of the electric flux. Now in the absence of charge, which is most of the time, we set that rho sub s term to zero. When that's the case, we see that the normal component of the electric flux is continuous across the interface. And so this tends to be the one that we think of as the boundary condition. Normal component of flux is continuous, but we have to remember that's really only con the conclusion when there's no surface charge. But away from charges, absolutely, normal component of D is continuous across the interface. So what's the boundary condition then for the normal component of the electric field intensity? Well, we start with the, the boundary condition that we just derived and we plug in the constitutive relation. So the normal component of D1 is simply the permittivity in medium one times the normal component of E1. This flux D2, normal component D2 is epsilon E2, the permittivity of the second medium times the normal component of E2, also all set equal to the surface charge density. So that's the general boundary condition. But most of the time we're looking at interfaces without any charge. And so in the absence of charge, the conclusion here is that the electric, the normal component of the electric field intensity is not continuous across the interface. However, the product of the permittivity times the normal component of the electric field intensity is continuous across the interface. So the second one tends to be the boundary conditions that we keep in our mind because that's the one we use most of the time. But please remember that's only the case when there's no surface charge. Boundary conditions for dielectric conductor interface. Here we have a very similar setup that we had for the dielectric dielectric interface. However, we're going to let medium two be a conductor. We're also going to assume here that the conductor is a perfect electric conductor. That means that the conductivity is infinite, equals infinity in the second medium. Remember Ohm's law from electromagnetics. This is sort of V equals IR, but we have the electric current density equals the conductivity times the electric field intensity. Now let's think about that. When the conductivity is infinite, do we get an infinite current? And the reality is we can have an extremely high conductivity, but we rarely see extremely high currents. And so really the conclusion here, since we can't really let this current density become infinite when the conductivity is infinite, the way to satisfy this is that the electric field intensity has to be zero inside of the conductor. So the big conclusion is inside a perfect conductor, electric field intensity is zero. So if the electric field is zero down here, and the tangential component of the electric field intensity has to be continuous across the interface, then that means the tangential component of the electric field in the medium one has to be zero. 
we can't really make any conclusions about the normal component, but what we can say is that the electric field in medium one only has a normal component. That means all the electric field lines that terminate onto a conductor terminate perpendicular to that conductor. The electric field immediately at the interface of a metal can only have a normal component. That's because the tangential component is forced to be zero. Let's end with some notes about perfect conductors. No electric field can exist inside of a perfect conductor. The electric field intensity is zero inside that conductor. If the electric field is zero, that tells us that the electric potential cannot vary. That does not mean there can't be electric potential. It just means it can't vary. It is constant throughout that conductor. And the last thing, when an electric field terminates onto a perfect electric conductor, it terminates perfectly perpendicular to that interface because it can't have a tangential component. The tangential component has to be zero in order to satisfy the tangential component of the electric fields being the same on either side of the interface.